everything Jesus did on earth, he did to demonstrate his complete authority over all heaven and earth. And so when he says, go therefore, we had better obey because all creation obeys the voice of Jesus. This is season 10 of Guerrilla Christianity. My name is Pastor Brett Walker, and I want to thank you for listening to Guerrilla Christianity, an unconventional, no apologies exposition of God's grace from an evangelical Methodist point of view. And God's Word is central to all we believe, so let's get into God's Word right now. Uh, now, I would invite you to take out your Bibles, either the ones that you brought with you or the ones in the pews, and turn in them with me to the book of Matthew. Chapter 28 and verses 16 through 20. Today we're beginning a new series called According to Matthew, and we'll be talking about what the series entails in a minute. Uh, we've been spending a lot of time in the epistles of Peter and Paul, and now we turn our attention to the gospel track in the lectionary. In fact, as I have reviewed every summer series I have ever preached. This is the first time I am preaching strictly from one of the Gospels. And today we are beginning at the end of Matthew's Gospel with the Great Commission. Therefore, let us hear the word of the Lord for us. Matthew chapter 28, verses 16 through 20. Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee, into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore, and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you alway, even unto the end of the world. Amen. This is the word of the Lord for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. Well, as I said, we are beginning a new series called According to Matthew. Uh, and for the next three months, we're going to be looking at the gospel according to St. Matthew for our sermon topics. Matthew's Gospel has a few unique features that we want to look at as an overview to the series. First, this Gospel was written by, anyone? Matthew. <laughs> His name's right on it, right? Uh, now, who is Matthew? He's one of the 12 disciples. It's not just any Matthew. This is the Matthew who is one of the 12 disciples. Disciples. In Matthew chapter 9 and verse 9, we read the account of the calling of Matthew, who was a tax collector. In Matthew 9 9, it says that as Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man called Matthew sitting at the tax booth, and he said to him, Follow me. And he rose and followed him. Now, that this gospel was written by and attributed to a tax collector adds to its genuineness. Because no one would claim that it was written by a tax collector if it was not. Nobody liked tax collectors. So God uses the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God uses the weak things of the world to shame the strong. And God has chosen a tax collector, a hated tax collector, to write the history of Jesus Christ as he walked on the earth and to be placed first in our gospel canon. So it also adds to the depth of the gospel that he's written, it's written by a tax collector because it demonstrates the radical transformation that happens when Christ calls us. Jesus called him, he got up, and he followed now, second, the gospel is written by a Jewish reader, I'm sorry, a Jewish writer to a Jewish audience. 
Matthew points to several Old Testament prophecies that are fulfilled in Jesus. And so he's, he's saying to this Jewish audience, this is the coming Messiah, this Jesus. Third, Matthew's gospel shares several features with Mark's and Luke's gospels. And so it's called one of the synoptic gospels. Now, the word synoptic is a fancy word that just means same eyes, sin optic, right? So they're based on similar eyewitness accounts, which is why they contain a lot of the same material. But Matthew's gospel also contains some things that the others do not. Like Luke's gospel, it contains a thorough genealogy that traces Jesus' line back through David to Abraham. Also, like Luke's gospel, Matthew's account includes the nativity and the virgin birth of Jesus. However, Matthew is the only one of the gospel writers who records the coming of the Magi from the east and the massacre of the innocents in Bethlehem at the hands of Herod the Great. Now, the last thing that we see in Matthew's gospel, the very last thing which you just read five minutes ago, get, is the Great Commission. We call this the Great Commission. Okay, it's the church has been following this mission for 2000 years. So that's what we're going to be looking at today to begin our journey through the gospel according to Matthew. A little bit of context. Again, this comes at the end of the gospel. It's called or we call it the Great Commission. You don't find those words in the Bible themselves itself. Um, some. Bibles have a heading that says the Great Commission, right? Um, that was added later just basically as kind of like a guideline for where these stories are. But it's not part of the actual gospel uh, writing itself. Um, so this comes at the end of the gospel. It's, we're talking about after the resurrection, after Jesus has been seen, prior to his ascension into heaven. That's the context of what we read this morning. And from this, we're going to see three different things. Okay, verse 16. Then the eleven disciples went into, away into Galilee, into a mountain where Jesus appointed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. So the first point I want to make here today is this. Physical proof is not proof to an unbeliever. And by unbeliever, I mean those who are not regenerated, those who have not been born again. If you have belief, if you can look to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, then you have been born again. Because Jesus said that without being born again, you cannot even see the kingdom of heaven. Those who are unregenerate cannot see the truth of the gospel. Now, the 11 in verse 16 were the 12 disciples minus Judas Iscariot, who had killed himself for betraying Jesus. We're told that the 11 went away into Galilee, to a uh, mountain where Jesus had appointed them. So earlier in this chapter, in chapter 28, verse 7, the angel, of the, the angel that had rolled away the stone and was sitting on the stone, and the, the women were there when they had gone to see the body of Jesus, he tells them that Jesus is not here, he is risen as he has said, and then he says, Go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And behold, he goeth before you into Galilee. There shall ye see him. Lo, I have told you. So he says, go tell his, his brothers, his followers, his disciples to go meet him in, in Galilee. He's going before you to Galilee. Right? Later on, Jesus himself meets the women as they're going and he says to them, don't be afraid. Go tell my brethren that they go into Galilee 
and there they shall see me. So that's two places now that the women have been told to tell the disciples, go to Galilee. And so what did they do? The 11 went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had appointed them. And when they saw him, they worshiped him. They worshiped him, no doubt, similarly to the women who first encountered the risen Christ, because in verse 9 it says that as they went to tell the disciples, behold, Jesus met them, saying, All hail, and they came and they held him by the feet and worshipped him. No doubt that these, uh, these 11 disciples worshipped him similarly. Now remember that these 11 had been walking with Christ. They had been walking with him for three and a half years, but they looked at him as a man, as a teacher. They knew from Peter's proclamation that he was something more than that because Peter said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus affirmed that for them. So they knew he was something more than just a human prophet. But now that he, they watched him die on the cross, they watched him put into the tomb, and now it's two days later, and they, now they're seeing him alive in their presence. And so they worshiped him. But we are told, some doubted because, again, even physical proof is no proof to an unbeliever. Okay? There's going to be some doubt. And until God opens our eyes, we cannot see the truth of the gospel. Listen, I, I wrestled with this every time I, the very first time I read through the Bible, I, I, I kept reading through like the account of what happens to the Hebrews and the people in the book of Judges. And, and I keep going, what's wrong with you people? You know, why aren't you getting this? Well, that was after I had been reborn. That was after God opened my eyes. I could see it plain as day in the pages of the Bible, but they were in it and couldn't see it. They witnessed God perform 10 plagues on the people of Egypt because Pharaoh would not let the people go. And after the 10th plague, what did they do? Pharaoh let them go. Then they were trapped against the Red Sea. And Pharaoh and his chariots came up charging behind them. God appeared as a pillar of fire and separated the Hebrews from the Egyptian chariots. And then he parted the sea. He opened it up. Okay, We're not talking about the tide going out. The Bible actually tells us that the water stood like a wall on either side of them. What you see in the Ten Commandments, the movie with Charlton Heston, that's accurate according to the Bible. They walked through on dry land. They get to the other side. The fire of God dissipates. The chariots come charging into the Red Sea. The Red Sea falls on them, destroys them all. The Hebrews didn't lift a finger. What did they do? They made a golden calf and they worshiped that. Physical proof is no proof to an unbeliever. I've seen a lot of people who say, well, you know, if God came down, if God opened up the skies and came down and stood right in front of me, I might believe. Actually, Friedrich Nietzsche, a oh, wonderful thinker he is, once said that if God stood in front of me, I would believe in him even less. Hmm. Why? Because he doesn't have to prove himself. He's God. And if you're not going to believe in him, you're not going to believe in him, even if he stands right in front of you. I saw this video on uh, TikTok. I don't know TikTok. Don't worry about it. I'm, I repent of that, okay? <sighs> but this guy is driving along. He's driving his car at night, making a TikTok video, driving his car. Mm. But, and he said, and he was an atheist, and he said, you know, there is no God, and, I, and to prove it, if there were a God, there would be a crash of lightning in three, two, one. Crash. <laughs> there was lightning right then. Perfect timing. And he just looks at the camera and goes, okay, this is disturbing. Yeah, it ought to be. 
But did he believe after that? Probably not, because again, physical proof is no proof even to the unbelieving. So, they worshipped him, but some doubted. So Jesus now establishes his authority, and this is the second point. The second point is that Jesus has been given all authority by the Father. Okay, Jesus didn't give himself the authority. Jesus didn't take the authority. He was given the authority because of his obedience to God the Father. Now, we're talking about the second person of the Trinity. We're talking about God the Son, who has existed for all of eternity. Okay, he's not created. He's begotten, not made. He, had, he is eternally coexistent with the Father and with the Holy Spirit. We call this the Trinity. And we as Christians don't worship three gods. We worship one God in unity. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Okay? It's, it can be confusing. It's okay. Just Trinity. Yes, go. It comes to you. It really does. It's what we call a holy mystery. But he says, all power is given unto me in heaven and earth. All power, all authority, all authority, okay, over every living creature, indeed over all creation, as a fulfillment of Daniel's prophecy of the coming Messiah. Daniel chapter 7 and verses 13 and 14 say, I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of the heaven, there came one like a son of man. And he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. And to him, to this son of man, was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. He was speaking of the coming Messiah, and Jesus is now saying, I am he, that is me. All authority is given unto me in heaven and earth. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 22, which we read just a couple weeks ago, Peter says he's gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels and authorities and powers having been subjected to him. But again, this power is not taken by Jesus. He is given it by God the Father. All power, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Nothing accepted. Jesus is the Lord of all creation. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 10 says, as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. Why do you think he said it that way? Things in heaven and things on earth. You know, most writers would just say things in heaven and on earth. Things in heaven and earth. Things in heaven and and things on earth. What Paul is saying is all things, everything, nothing is accepted. Everything is under the authority of Christ. He says, all authority is given unto me by the Father, to whom Jesus submits as the second person of the Godhead. <clears throat> John chapter 3 and verse 35, Jesus says, The Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. Has given all things into his hand. John 17 verses 1 and 2, Jesus in his high priestly prayer lifts up his eyes to heaven and says, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son that the Son may glorify you since you have given him Authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. Authority is given to Christ by the Father. In Acts chapter 2, Peter, when he's speaking to the people, tells them, Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and 
and Christ. Lord, because he has given dominion over all things. Christ, because he is the promised coming of the anointed one. So, he has authority on all powers given unto me in heaven and earth. And then we come to these two verses, verses 19 and 20, which is, makes up the Great Commission itself. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. So, this is the third point. Under Christ's authority, we, his disciples, are sent to make disciples of all the world. That's the mission of the church. It's the one and only mission of the church. The church's mission is not to feed people. The church's mission is not to clothe people, to house people. Listen, don't misunderstand what I'm saying. Yes, we do those things. We do those things out of the Christian love that we have for our neighbor. And we do those things rightly. But our mission is first and foremost to make disciples of all nations. Okay? He says, go ye therefore. Go ye therefore. Therefore, why? Why, Jesus? I just told you why. Because all authority has been given to him by the Father. He is all authority. Because Jesus is the ultimate authority over all creation, as demonstrated in his acts on earth, he says, go, therefore. All authority. He turned water to wine, demonstrating his lordship over the elements. He healed the sick, demonstrating his lordship over every disease and microbe. He made the lame walk and the blind see, demonstrating his lordship over the human body, the creation of God. He fed the multitude with five loaves and two fish, demonstrating his provision as God did as the Israelites wandered in the wilderness for 40 years, feeding them with manna from heaven. He raised Lazarus from the dead in whose body decay had already begun demonstrating his authority over death and life. He commanded the wind and rain to cease, and they obeyed his voice. He commanded demons to flee, and they obeyed his voice. He said he had authority to lay down his life and to take it up again, and after dying on the cross, he rose again on the third day. Everything Jesus did on earth, he did to demonstrate his complete authority over all heaven and earth. And so when he says... Go, therefore, we had better obey because all creation obeys the voice of Jesus. Go and do what? He says, now the the King James says, teach all nations. That word there is disciplo. What is that word? Disciple. Go make disciples. Disciples. Go and disciple all nations. You can use that word as a a noun or as a verb, okay? To be a disciple, a disciple is a student, a learner, someone who is learning at the foot of the master, okay? That's a disciple. That's who we all are. We're all disciples. We're all here learning at the foot of the master. Not me, but the word of God, okay? And... But you can use it as a verb as well. To disciple someone means to take them alongside of you and teach them all the things that you know about God, about Christ, about the Holy Spirit. Go, therefore, and teach all nations. Make disciples of all nations. Now, what it means to make disciples, we're going to look at in the next phrase. But what does he say? He says, all nations. That word, all nations, is the Greek word ethnos. It means all races and tribes, not geopolitical divisions, but everybody. Every race, creed, everybody. 
skin color, it doesn't matter. We're going to teach everybody. We're going to make everybody disciples. The Jews will receive the good news, but so will the Gentiles. Let me ask you this. How many of you here were born Gentiles? That should be all of you. Unless you were born Jewish. If you were born Jewish, then you're Jewish. That's fine. But if you're not, you're a Gentile. That's the whole world. Okay? Jews and non-Jews. Jews and Gentiles. Now, that's not to say that there are no Jewish believers in Christ, because there are. In fact, I have a cousin who is a Christian believer, and she came to faith from the preaching of Jews for Jesus. Um, That's a fantastic outreach ministry that reaches out to Jewish people and teaches them that Jesus is the Messiah. But the vast majority of Christians in the world today are Gentiles. We're the world. We're the nations. We're the ethnos. Okay? In Luke chapter 24, uh, Jesus said to his disciples, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations. Beginning from Jerusalem. Beginning from Jerusalem. So, there's a slightly different version of this in the book of Acts that Luke records, okay? In the book of Acts, Jesus says to his disciples, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and to all the world. Now, what does that mean? Think about the order of those things in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and to all the world. They're expanding outward concentric circles, okay? So what is Jerusalem? Jerusalem is our seat of worship. It's where the temple is for the Jews, okay? For us, it's the church. That means that we begin discipleship, we make disciples in our church, We disciple each other. We teach each other about Christ and God and and, and all that God's word proclaims. Okay? So, and it's not just me discipling all of you, but we should all be discipling each other. Okay? I I have pastor friends that I meet with regularly, and we disciple each other. Okay, what does that mean? In Proverbs, we are told that iron sharpens iron. As iron sharpens iron, so a man sharpens another man. Man, woman, doesn't matter. It's the thing is, we sharpen each other. We work together. We learn from each other. I'm learning, I learn things from my wife all the time. She learns stuff from me. Um, I have been discipling my mother for many years, and I have learned a lot from her. This is a woman who lost a child 18 days after it was born. That's rough. And I said to her, Mom, how did you do it? How did you get through that? She said, I put my hand in the hand of Jesus. Wow. I want faith like that. And so she disciples me. I disciple her. We disciple each other. We don't just come to church on on a Sunday morning. This has to be our life, and we we help each other. Right? So, baptizing. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Ghost. Notice it's the name, singular. Singular. Jesus gives this triune formula for baptism. We're to be baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It's one name because the three persons of the Godhead are one God. That forms the Christian, the basis of Christian belief in a triune God. Okay? Right here, he gives it to us. The name. It's not the names of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It's the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Why? Because the three are one, God. We profess faith in one God. 
One God only. And some people have said that we worship three gods. That's not true. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, they are one God. And that's what we're observing today on Trinity Sunday. So we baptize. This is what we do for, this is how we make disciples. How do you make disciples? You baptize them and then you what? Teach. Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. Teaching. Teaching. Discipleship doesn't end with baptism. It begins there and then we teach. I am so grateful that in this church, we have so many children who are still here that I have baptized. I baptized a lot of children over the years. Not all of them continue, but what a blessing it is when they do, when they keep coming. Why? We make this promise when they're baptized. As a congregation, we're going to draw, we're bringing them into our family. You know, it's, it may sound funny, but all of you, when, when I'm up here and I'm, I'm, I'm baptizing a, a, an infant in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, what happens? This is no longer a son, a daughter, a grandchild. This is a sister. This is a brother. This is now one who is adopted in the family of God. Okay? And so we teach them. We teach them. And discipleship is a lifelong endeavor. It never ends. There's never a point where you're like, I get it. I have it all. I know it all. I'm done. You know? And thank goodness for that. Because what a boring existence that would be to just walk around. Oh, I know it all. I know it all. I've learned everything there is to learn. You might as well just lay down in a coffin right there, you know, because <laughs> now we begin our journey of learning as disciples. Discipleship doesn't end with baptism. It begins there. As disciples, we are to make disciples. That's our job. As disciples, we make disciples of others through baptism and teaching the ordinance of God through his holy word. And then finally, he says this. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. I am with you. I am with you always. Matthew's gospel begins with Jesus described as Emmanuel, God with us. In verse, chapter 1, verse 23, Matthew says, Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. And now he ends his gospel with a promise that Jesus is with us always as we go into the world and make disciples of all nations. When we obey the Great Commission, we do not go alone, but God the Son goes with us. We need only walk by faith and obedience. So how are we, the church, responding to the Great Commission today? There are 2.2 billion Christians on the planet but there's also 6 billion non-Christians. Now, does that seem like a daunting task? Remember last week how we saw 120 proclaimed Christ and him crucified and 3,000 were added to their ranks. Not simply 3,000 new followers of Christ, but 3,000 disciples baptized that day and learning under the teaching of the apostles. So maybe a harvest field of six billion seems like too big of a task. Let me bring it closer to home. There are 1,200 people living in Olmans Township. On any given Sunday, about 200 of them are in worship. I know, I talk to the other pastors in town. And that means there's roughly 1,000 of our neighbors who don't know the saving grace of God and Jesus Christ. Thousand? Is that too much? What about your next door neighbor? What do they know about Christ? When's the last time you asked? The mission of the church, its primary purpose is to make disciples of Jesus Christ. 
On this Trinity Sunday, when we celebrate the triune nature of the Godhead, let us heed the words of God the Son, by whose authority we are commanded to go and make disciples. Let us pray. Almighty God, you have sent us your Son to teach us and to demonstrate his authority in the working of miracles and by raising him from the dead. Give us the faith to believe and not doubt. As we hear the voice of our Savior today, may we go forth in obedience to make disciples of all nations, starting in our homes and in our community. And let us not forget that discipleship is a lifelong endeavor. Sometimes it seems like we don't know much, but certainly we know enough to teach others that Christ died for their sins, that he offers us eternal life in his name. The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. We pray that you would send laborers into the fields of harvest. In the name of Christ our Redeemer, amen. Thank you for listening to today's episode. My hope and prayer for you is that today's teaching has blessed you as much as it has blessed me putting this message together. God has also blessed me by calling me to serve two churches in Salem County, New Jersey, Ebenezer United Methodist Church in Auburn and Hudson United Methodist Church in Patricktown. If you live in the area and don't have a faith community of your own, I'd like to invite you to join us on Sunday mornings. Ebenezer meets for worship at 9 a.m. and Hudson meets for worship at 10.30. We are Bible-believing, gospel-preaching, Christ-adoring congregations in the heart of New Jersey's farmland. And we also have Bible study during the week. Of course, if you don't live in the area, get involved with the church where you are. We are not called to be Christians in isolation, but in community. So I would encourage you to live out your faith with a group of like-minded believers where you are. Now, if our message today has touched you in some way, won't you please let us know? Send us an email, drop us a comment, subscribe, and share this message with someone who needs to hear it. Keep learning, keep growing, and I pray you will join us for Guerrilla Christianity again. Until then, remember this, Christ died for you. Now go live for Christ.